Uh, see, I'm going to do, you don't see me doing it, but I'm going to make some adjustments here and stuff on the sidebar so it doesn't interfere with my slides. Okay. Properties of solutions. Uh, and for this course, when we talk about solutions, it's primarily aqueous solutions. Um, some of you are going into MLT programs. Some of you might be going into health professions. Well, MLT, of course, is health professions, but it's a little different animal. <clears throat> but um, it makes sense to study aqueous solutions uh, rather than non-aqueous solutions. Uh, so in the interest of time, plus the human body is, is around 60% water anyway. So anything that you do inside the human body is going to eventually end up in aqueous solution. Even if it goes in as a solid, uh, your body doesn't have access to it until it's in solution. So we're going to study, we're going to talk about uh, solutions. Um, the misconception or the mm, popular conception of solutions that says they're usually solids dissolved in liquids. And that's only one kind of solution. Um, we learned early on, maybe last semester in fact, that a uh, solution is a homogeneous mixture. Uh, and which broadens the field quite a bit. You can have a homogeneous mixture of, of just about of any phase of the solute and solvent. In fact, um, just to be sure I'm not using terms that haven't been defined yet, the uh, solvent is the major component. And the solute, actually it could be plural, the solutes are the minor components. So you can have you can have more than one solute in a solution, but you can only have one component of the solution identified as the solvent. And it's it's always the major component. At least in the beginning, when you first start to make the solution, the solvent will be the major component. Um, so let's look at possibilities. All right, whenever you mix um, a gas with a gas, you always get a solution every time. And it just makes sense. I mean, intuitively, if you know anything about gases, you know the particles are very far apart compared to liquids and solids. So there's plenty of room for everybody. I mean, the, the space is already there. <clears throat> you just fit the other gas inside the uh, solvent gas, and you've got a solution. Examples, air, right? primarily nitrogen, 79%, uh, oxygen, around 20%, and the other 1% is various other gases. Mostly argon, as a matter of fact, the uh, inert gas, argon. Um, other types of solutions. Right, liquids in liquids, um, booze, any kind of booze is ethanol in water with some other components. Or antifreeze. Antifreeze is, is typically mixed in a 50 50 ratio, that is by volume. <clears throat> so, there, you know, which is the solvent and which is the solute? Well, we generally accept water as the solvent for antifreeze. So, when you put ethylene glycol into your uh, engine when you're first filling it up. Well, they do that at the factory, of course. We used to do it ourselves if, if needed. And um, you start off with a lot of water and then you gradually add ethylene glycol to it and makes your antifreeze. Uh, brass is a solution of two solids, primarily copper as the solvent and nickel as the solute. And sometimes there can be some other minor components in there. But those two solids go together to make a solid solution. Now, of course, if you try to <laughs> put two solids together, 
it's not going to work. So to make the solution, of course, you have to melt them and uh, mix the liquids together. And then when they solidify, you have a solid solution. Carbonated water, where you have gas in a liquid. Carbon dioxide gas is dissolved in water. And you go by any uh, fast food chain like uh, Wendy's or McDonald's, and somewhere on the outside of the building is going to be this huge silver tank of liquid carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide is piped into the building and used to carbonate their beverages as they produce them in the fountain. <clears throat> uh, so that's carbon dioxide dissolved in water, makes a liquid. Uh, typically, this is the one we think of as a solution, a solid dissolved in a liquid. Like seawater would be an example, where the primary solute is sodium chloride, right? But you have other solids dissolved in there, like um, calcium chloride or magnesium chloride or potassium chloride. Primarily chlorides, but there are other possibilities. Uh, sugar solution, right? When you make up um, your hummingbird feeder water, you generally put 50-50 sugar and water. And uh, you can mix it cold and eventually the sugar will all go into solution. Of course, it'll go into solution faster if you heat it up first. But uh, that's one of those cases where you can start off with the major component as water and you start adding sugar to it and you can just keep adding sugar up to 80, 90% before you finally get too much and you saturate the solution. That's a case where the solvent was the major component when you started, but it's the minor component when you end it. <clears throat> so just for simplicity and by convention, we accept water as the solvent for a concentrated sucrose solution. In fact, you can get sucrose so concentrated in that solution that uh, industry very often uses the liquefied or dissolved version of sucrose to transport sucrose from one place to the other. Um, because you've got the most of it is sugar and that's what you want and just a little bit of it is water. So you really don't waste a lot of energy transporting water that you don't want. Plus, when you get there, it's easier to handle because you can pump the sugar solution um, where you want it to go in your factory uh, rather than moving solid. It's easier to move liquid than it is to move solid in, in that environment. So I've got a book on my shelf called This Is Liquid Sugar. And it's, it's all about using uh, the sugar solutions in uh, an industrial environment. Um, the last one on the list is gas dissolved in a solid, which is kind of odd to think about, but it happens. Uh, you, the catalytic converter in your car is packed with little ceramic beads. Why ceramics? Because they're cheap and because they will stand the high temperatures that are generated in the catalytic converter. They won't break down. And then we, we coat those ceramic beads with platinum and uh, other uh, expensive metals like, uh, let's see, platinum and palladium, I think, are the two most common. Uh, so when the, the gas from your engine exits through the catalytic converter, it dissolves in that surface of platinum and, and palladium. And uh, while it's there, it undergoes a reaction, which completes the reaction that was incomplete inside your engine and produced the pollutants. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna have to not use the black today. Not erasing very well. Let's try blaring. 
Um, so other possibilities, you, hydrogen can dissolve in platinum. That's used in the industry to hydrogenate oils. So unsaturated oils have a very um, low melting point. Right, so they're most they're liquid at room temperature predominantly. Uh, but if you want to, if you want the certain characteristics of an oil that would cause the food product to be uh, solid at room temperature and not soggy with your liquid oils, then you hydrogenate it. So, uh, in short, unsaturated oils will have. Uh, double bonds between the carbons, right? So we we hydrogenate it uh, over a catalyst, which is platinum, with hydrogen, and you substitute in here hydrogens. Okay, and that makes the melting point higher. The problem is, it's not healthy for consumption because the the human body doesn't like that type of oil. It likes some unsaturated oils. So if you have a constant diet of saturated fats, uh, it's you know, there are consequences. Let's just leave it at that. Okay, so those are possible um, homogeneous mixtures that qualify with the different phases Now, one other thing that we want to do when we're talking about solutions, since we've got the major component and the minor components possible, we want to identify the concentration of those components because that concentration can vary. Um, not within the solution, once you've established it, but you can add other things and change the concentration. So we want a way to express that. And it depends on what you're going to do with the information as to which one is best. Uh, probably uh, one of the most, the most common expression of concentration in chemistry is molarity. And we abbreviate that with a big M. We can use a big M uh, because there's no element in the periodic chart that has just an M. There are always two, two letters like MG for magnesium or MN for manganese or uh, what's another one? Let's see. Nothing pops out at me right now. Anyway, oh, MD, one of the actinides, MD, I think that's Mendelevium. Anyway, so molarity is expressed as the moles of the solute, the minor component, and I abbreviate, abbreviate moles with a small n, no zero up here. If I put a little zero up there as a superscript, it means neutrons. But a little n just means moles. And then that is ratioed to the overall volume of the solution. And this is going to be moles. And this will be liters. Established by convention. That volume has to be liters, and this has to be moles of the solute. Um, another possibility, mass percent. You say, what's the mass of the solute relative to the mass of the solution? Right. So we can say percent. Very often it'll be suffixed with M over M. When we say percent, percent is a dimensionless number. It has no dimensions inherent. So when we say percent, we mean parts per hundred. So when you say parts of the solute per hundred parts of the solution, what do you mean? Do you mean mass, 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 volume, volume, volume? So if we specify MM, that means mass of the solute per mass of the solution. There's another possibility for mass down here that's sometimes used is mass of the solvent rather than mass of the solution. 
<clears throat> so in that case, you need even more specificity to tell what it is. But the calculation is simple. You just say mass of the solute divided by the mass of the solution times 100. And that's percent by mass. Another useful one is mole fraction. Mole fraction is identified with this fancy X whenever I can get it. Sometimes I use just a plain big X. The mole fraction of A in the solution is just the moles of A per total moles. Okay? And it is exactly what it says it is. It's a fraction. It's a decimal fraction. So this number will always be less than one if you have a solution. If it's pure, then it'll be equal to one. And then mole fraction has no meaning, really. Um, so you need to know the moles of A. You need to know, know the moles of the solvent. And then add them together to make the total moles because the moles of A will also be contained in that part of the formula. Now that's only if there's solute, one solute and solvent. If there's more than one, then you can have mole fraction of B is just the moles of B and for moles of total. Now if A and B are together, then both A and B are down here in the total. So don't forget, when you're working a problem, be sure that for mole fraction, the moles down here are actually the total moles of the solution. Everything there that's there in moles, and we're talking about counting, the number of particles, the number of molecules, the number of ions, whatever the case may be. And then you ratio the individual solute to the total. Okay, uh, last one, molality. Molality is a little m. Now, of course, as long as these are off by themselves, separate letters, that's what they mean. That's molality. This would be molarity. If you prefix a unit of measure with these, either of these, then it has a different meaning. Remember, this is milli in front of something like milliliters. And this is mega, which is a million times uh, something like grams, mega grams. Right? So only when they're separate letters do they mean molarity or molality. Now, what does molality mean? Molality is still the moles of the solute. That hasn't changed. But now the denominator has changed, whereas molarity is the liters or volume of the solution. Molality is the mass of the solvent in kilograms. Okay. Now, why would we want to do that? I mean, isn't molarity good enough? We're talking about moles, right? For the solute relative to something having to do with the solution. The difference has to do with temperature. What is the effect on the molarity when temperature changes. Understand that the volume of, a, of anything, of any liquid, will change with temperature. It generally goes up. The volume increases as the temperature increases. So that will change your molarity for different temperatures. So molarity, if we have a standard molarity 
we'll talk about standard molarity, we need standard temperature and pressure. Standard temperature for these solutions is 25 degrees Celsius. But if we need a temperature insensitive concentration expression, molality is your go-to value because it's based on mass and mass doesn't change with temperature. So whenever we're, we're investigating something where we wanna know the concentration over, over a range of temperatures, and we know it's not gonna change the value that we assign, of course, then we use molality. It's relative to kilograms of the solvent. So it's volume for molarity versus mass for molality plus its volume of the entire solution for molarity versus mass of just the solvent for molality. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so I think the next few slides are, are just what I was telling you with some problems to solve. Like you have uh, one mole of sugar and 125 milliliters of solution, calculate the molarity. Right? So we have uh, one mole of solute. solute. How many liters of solution do you have? <laughs> you got to use the right units. 125 milliliters is how many liters? Well, a thousand milliliters in a liter. So if you move the decimal place to the left three places, you get liters. Or if you prefer, you can use dimensional analysis. Milliliters, liters, remember, got to cancel those two. And then the ratio is 10 to the third. So you divide by a thousand means the decimal moves to the left. Or you say 125 over a thousand is 0 0.125 uh, liters, excuse me, liters. So that goes in here in the denominator, and then you divide 0.125 into one, and I think that's eight, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, eight molar. So that's an extremely concentrated solution of sugar. Okay, give me just a second. This board is bugging me. I'm going to clean it off. Okay. You may wonder what I just used. I found that Goo Gone works great on resistant colors, especially if you're using an old whiteboard that's sort of, its finish is sort of wearing off, which means that the colors sort of get down in the pores of the board and they don't want to come out. So the Goo Gone works well. Plus, It's got those citrus oils in them, and the oils go down in the little pores instead and keep the colors from getting in. So I've tried everything, probably a dozen different types of cleaning, uh, cleaning solutions. That one works the best. And normally Goo Gone, well, originally Goo Gone was a liquid that you had to squirt out on your rag but I found this one is kind of a, uh, it's a spray. Works great. 
Okay, back to the topic. <clears throat> Let's say you have 10 moles, 10 molar sugar solution. So if, this one's even more concentrated. What volume of this solution do you need to have also two moles of sugar? Remember, these are formula definitions. Molarity equals moles divided by volume. It's a mathematical expression. It works just like any other mathematical expression. It's an equation. So if I know two of those, I can solve for the third one. In this case, I know that one, 10 molar. And um, the volume is in question. We don't know what it is. But we are given two moles of sugar that we want to, to have in this volume that we extract from the total. And the only reason, reason we can do that is because this is a solution. It's a homogeneous mixture. So if I take the volume that I need out of that solution anywhere in the solution, I should get two moles of sucrose. So we just solve it, right? Put the volume over here, put the concentration over here, divide two by 10 is one fifth or 0 0.2. So 0 0.2 liters well let's see my goo gone's working too good now i can't even write on my own board Zero point two liters we'll give you uh i left off my significant figures i i was permitted three i only gave you one <clears throat> 0.2 liters so how many milliliters is that? 200, right? Milliliters are a thousandth of a liter, so that means you need a thousand times as many milliliters to make a liter. So a thousand times 0.2 is 200. I think the more I wipe it, the better it'll get. <clears throat> okay, how about these two? We have two different solutions, one of sodium hydroxide and one of potassium chloride. And you make each by dissolving 100 grams of each in 250 milliliters of final solution. What's the concentration of each in molarity? Well, first of all, how would you make a solution like that? And it doesn't matter which one, we can say the same thing about either one. Well, the final volume needs to be what? 250 milliliters, right? So you need to know exactly that your container has 250 milliliters. And it just so happens we have glassware that's calibrated to hold 250 milliliters. It's called a volumetric flask. Has long, narrow neck like this. We probably use those in, uh, in, in uh, 103. I'm pretty sure we did. Anyway, 250 milliliters, how would you make up that solution? Well, um, you could just dump the solid in here and then start adding water. Uh, and that would work for potassium chloride. But if you did that for sodium hydroxide, uh, you get excessive heat built up quickly because the enthalpy of solution for sodium hydroxide is extremely exothermic. So that's why we say, do as you oughta add acid to water. Works the same for bases. It just doesn't rhyme. Well, you could say add bases to water. But if it's solid to begin with, or if it's very concentrated, like 98% sulfuric acid, 
and you want to dilute it, you put a lot of water in there first. Then you start adding the uh, solute. So let's say this is our 250 milliliter mark, and we've got, we put water in it first. We need, we need to have that headspace in there to finish the process. So we're going to add 100 grams of something. If this being the case, it doesn't matter what it is because we've taken precautions. And if, as the heat of solution builds, there's a lot of water to absorb the heat. That's why when you add water to a concentrated acid or a base, a little bit of water, there's so much heat build up in the beginning, it vaporizes the water and you get spattering, which is a hazard when you're talking about concentrated acids and concentrated bases. So let's say we add 100 grams of something in here. Now what do we do? Before we can dilute it to the volume, we have to be sure it's in solution. We gotta let it dissolve first, so we mix it up well. Be sure it's in solution. And then we feel it. Is it hot? Did it get cold? Some of them get cold. If the temperature has changed wildly, we have to wait. Or we put water in, in it up to about here and, and let it reach room temperature. Ideally, in the neighborhood of 25 degrees Celsius. Before we bring it to volume, what if you brought it, if it got hot, you brought it to volume right here? What would happen? As it cooled down, it would shrink. Then you'd have to bring the volume up again, which is okay. But if your solution got cold and you brought it here, then as it warmed to room temperature, it'd be up there. Nothing you can do about that. So as a general practice, um, you can make sure everything's dissolved the volume is up in this neighborhood and you be sure it's room temperature. Then you can dilute it to the volume. And in aqueous solutions, we're looking for the bottom of the meniscus on that line. Then you plug it, either a parafilm over the top or a stopper. And then you mix it. Now you know you have exactly 100 grams in 250 milliliters. So the molar, the molar concentration, then you have to calculate because 100 grams of sodium hydroxide is not the same number of moles as 100 grams of potassium chloride. So now that you know how to make the solution, we do the calculations. So you have 100 grams of sodium hydroxide in how many liters? 0.25. Or we could have said 250 milliliters and then made the uh, conversion. But this way we only have to convert one of them. So we need grams of sodium hydroxide converted to moles. So you need to know what's the sodium hydroxide molar mass. And that would be 23 plus 16 is what? 39. Yeah, 39. And then 1.01 .01 for the hydrogen. So it'd be 40.01. Okay. So you just divide that into this and divide that into that. And I'll go ahead and do it. So I get uh, 9 point. Nine point nine nine eight molar. How about potassium chloride? Well, 
that's not behaving either. Let's try this one. Okay, what's the molar mass of potassium chloride? Well, let's add it up. 39.1 and chlorine is 35.45. So I get 74.55. Okay, is that color showing? Yeah, it's showing up. Okay, just checking. So we divide this into 100. And then we divide 0.25 into that. And they get 5.3, let's see, four significant figures. 5.366. Okay, so the same mass of each solid, solute, dissolved in the same volume gives you a different molarity. Okay, so they rounded off to three significant figures instead of four. But we should be able to keep four, right? 100.0 is four significant figures. So they just threw away some information. Okay, how about mass percent? We got an example here. If you got, I guess I better erase this. Made a liar of me. Some of that purple still in there. Uh, okay, so if you have 5.5 grams of glucose and 78.2 grams of water, so which is the solvent, which is the solute? Water's the solvent, glucose is the solute. We want to know the mass percent. Well, the formula says we need five and a half grams of glucose. And then we need the total mass of the solution, which would be what? 78.2 plus 5.5. Don't forget that you've still got that mass in the total from the solute. And let's see, that's 83.7 here, divided into 5.5 times 100. Uh, let's see, is it five? Yeah, only two significant figures, so I can keep 6.6%. Uh, <clears throat> okay. How about mole fraction? Where would we use mole fraction? Well, you could definitely use it when you're dealing with gases, right? Because uh, the number of moles in a gas is proportional to the volume. As long as you keep the, what did Avogadro say? As long as you keep the temperature constant, the pressure constant, and the volume constant, then two containers have the same number of moles. If you put them together, like Dalton did with partial pressures, you find that the ratio of the partial pressures of the gases to the total is the same ratio as the mole fraction. <laughs> yeah. 
So what kind of problem are we dealing with here? Um, we've got eight grams of sulfuric acid in 100 milliliters of water. What's the mole fraction of, sulf of uh, phosphoric acid? Now, if we're going to do mole fraction, we've got to calculate the number of moles of the phosphoric acid and the number of moles of water. Right? So can we find the number of moles of water from 100 milliliters? Not directly, right? because we need mass to use molar mass for water. That's why we need to know the density. And of course, one gram per milliliter means that 100 milliliters is 100 grams. But I'll do it the long way. Let's see. Let me see if Brown's working again. Um, so we need the number of moles of phosphoric acid So what's the molar mass of phosphoric acid? Well, let's see. Hydrogen is 1.01, .01, so that's 3.03 .03 for the hydrogens. How about phosphorus? I have to look that one up. 30.97. Okay. And then oxygens. Each oxygen is 16. That means four of them is 64, correct? So 98.00. is the molar mass. So eight divided by 98.00 is, um, let's see, I'm trying to decide if I want to use scientific notation or let's use standard notation, 0 0.00816. Okay, moles. Okay, how many moles of water are there? Well, if we say that 100 milliliters of water is 100 grams, then we can go straight to grams. Oops, it's okay. We want to convert water. Uh, so, what's the molar mass of water? We've done that so many times, you ought to have it memorized. Two hydrogens is 2.02, 16 for water is 18.02 total. Divide it into 100. So 100, 18.02 divide. <coughs> so that's 5.5, four significant figures, 5.549. moles. Okay, so now we know the moles. What do we need? Well, we need to ratio the moles of phosphoric acid to the total. So we need to add these two together. Okay. So if we line up the decimals right here, then we bring the six down. Let's see. Actually, we bring the one six down. And then the nine is lined up with eight. So that's 17. Carry the one, four is five, five. There. Okay, so how many of those we can keep? We can only keep these right here. Right? Yes. Okay, so that's the total, which means 0 0.008. 1.6 divided by 5.557 times a, oh, not times 100. This is fraction, mole fraction. So 0 0.00816 in 5.557 divided. So I get, I'm going to have to put this in scientific notation. But too many leading zeros. 1.3. 1.47, 10 to the minus 3. Well, if we're gonna, okay, maybe I better, I'll express it both ways, just in case. So three places over. 
there. 0 0.00147 is the mole fraction of, uh, what did I do wrong? Hold on a second. Six, one, 17, it's five, 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 seven, point zero, zero. We'll try that again. Three places. Well, that's right. I think the answer is wrong. Make sure I didn't make a calculation error. Okay, let's look at this one again. Did I do that one right? This one is probably, that, that looks reasonable. Right? This one might be wrong. Let me try that one again. Yep. Okay, so I got to do this over. Now, we got 6, 10, 12, 13. There we go. Point oh one four five. There we go. Easy to make mistakes, believe me. Okay, so that's the mole fraction. We're also interested, I'm gonna leave this up here because I'm pretty sure the next thing we wanna do is the molality of that same solution, right? So we've already calculated the moles of the solute, eventually got it right. <clears throat> so what's the uh, mass of the solvent? A hundred grams is how many kilograms? Hundred grams of water would be 0 0.1 kilograms. In this case, we only want the mass of the solvent. Okay, so let's try that one. 0 0.0816 divided by 0 0.1 is 0 0.816. I could have done that one in my head if I'd have been thinking. Molal, 0.816 molal. Okay. So, now we've, we've covered the various types of expressions of concentration. Now we're going to try to explain how it is that solutions form. And remember, <clears throat> I've said it before, I'll say it again. Nature just does what it does. And we devise these scenarios, these schemes, these different approaches to try to wrap our heads around what's going on in nature. So nature just makes a solution. That's it. It either does or it doesn't. 
And what we're trying to do is understand what are the various steps to making that solution. And these steps one, two, three here, they, they happen simultaneously, right? The only sequence is when, like, when you add the solute to the solvent, there's a, a break in there where certain things are happening before other things can happen. But essentially, it all happens together. So what do you need? Well, if you've got a, uh, let's just say for simplicity, let's say we have a, a solid and a liquid like sodium chloride goes into water. So we have uh, a cube of sodium chloride. I'm gonna have to use the black, there's no way around it. Let's see. Uh, that's not a good drawing. Let's just say we've got uh, sodium chloride in a cube down here, and we put it in water. So what's going to happen? Well, first thing is you've got to break up the parts of the solute. You got to pull those ions apart. Or if it's sugar, you got to pull the sugar molecules apart, and that takes energy. So you have to put energy in. That means delta H is going to be positive, right? You got to put energy in to break up the solute, break the bonds between the solute parts. Then you have to overcome the intermolecular forces that are holding the solvent molecules together. So you got to put in energy here also. Break those things apart. So this is one, this is two. So once you've got these broken apart and you've made holes in your solvent, then the solute and the solvent can interact. And they can interact in varying ways. Sometimes it's a very strong interaction, right? They, they have intermolecular forces are very strong. Sometimes they're very weak. But generally speaking, there will be some interaction and you get uh, delta H, you get some energy back, exothermic. So in general, these first two steps are endothermic and the last step is exothermic. And the overall, add those all together with their signs, determines whether the overall delta H is endothermic or exothermic. Right? If these two together are huge, and this one's very small, then you're gonna have an endothermic overall enthalpy. But if these are small and this one's huge, then you'll have an exothermic overall enthalpy. All right? And that's what this diagram is supposed to show. So. Say we have this solute and there's your solvent. So you break this one apart, put energy in, you put energy in here, and then you get some of it back for the solution. And you should add them all together. Uh, I've already said that. And I've already said this. And this is what it looks like in a graph. Like one and two, you have to add energy to it, right? So the energy level goes up for the system, right? Everything's referenced to the system. So you put energy in. And if you get a lot of energy back, then the difference is negative, which means exothermic. Whereas on this one, if you put a lot of energy in, but you only get a little bit back, then the overall is endothermic. Okay, let's see if we can explain why water and oil don't mix. All right, let's see. I got to do this on my own because the slide doesn't tell us. All right, 
So we've got oil and water. So oil is going to be the solute, water is going to be the solvent. So we got oil and water. So step one. Break the oil molecules apart. Well, think about oil as a, well, they describe it here, long chain hydrocarbon. It's nonpolar. Right? You have um, carbons linked together, and then hydrogens all around. Like all the way around. So the molecule is nonpolar. So what's holding them together in that liquid? London dispersion forces. That's it. Nothing else. So very weak forces. So the input of energy here is, is um, it's positive, but it's very small. OK? How about water? Step two. All right, we've got to put energy in here. All right, plus. But water is a polar molecule. So the forces holding it together are hydrogen bonds, which are very strong for intermolecular forces. They're extremely strong. So you've got to put a lot of energy here, large. Step three, there will be a limited interaction. Remember when we said water, well, um, all molecules can experience London dispersion forces, right? And if this molecule is nonpolar, then London dispersion is all it's got at, at its disposal then the London dispersion forces from water are the only thing that will interact with it. So you're going to get back a very small amount. So this might be negative, but it's very small. Okay. So add this one together with that one is very large, but you get a very little bit of energy back in those cases where the return where you have um, small, large, and small, this is plus, this is plus, this is minus. What you get is um, a very large positive. Okay. <clears throat> Which generally means that the solution will not form because it's very, that it takes a lot of energy that has to go in um, and you don't get much of it back. So, um, practical example, if you've, if you've ever watched uh, an old engine being cleaned, they'll strip everything, all the peripherals away from it, and then they'll get out the steam hose and they'll blow steam at it. And it'll clean all that grease and grime off of the engine. It'll look brand new. So what's happening? Well, there's some force from the steam. It's coming out at a pretty high velocity. So it's going to blow big chunks off. But that doesn't get down in the little cracks. What happens is, with all the extra energy that's put in, you do form a solution of oil, grease, in water. At least until it cools down. When it cools down, then you've got grease all over your floor, separated from the water. But as long as it's hot, it'll form a solution because it requires lots and lots of input. Okay. 
All right, so there's your example and why the solution, why they don't mix. And that was in the case of, let's see, nonpolar solute and polar solvent. That would be oil and water. Okay. So what you have is a large positive delta H, and that does not favor solution formation. Similarly, if the solute is polar and the solvent is nonpolar, you'll just have to switch terms here. But you still end up with a large positive delta H, which means solution is not likely to form at room temperature. You gotta put a lot of energy into it to make it happen. But when you have nonpolar, uh, polar, polar, and nonpolar, polar, nonpolar, nonpolar, the difference is a small delta H. Because with the polar, polar, you have to put a lot of energy in, right? The intermolecular forces have to be broken, but you get a lot back. So the difference is small. With a nonpolar, nonpolar, you don't have to put much in to get them apart and you don't get much back either. So the difference there is also small. So that solution will form. So condense all of this into a simple statement, like dissolves like. That is polar dissolves polar, nonpolar dissolves nonpolar, and never the twain shall meet. Um, uh, we, we could talk about probability here, but, um, there's just a general statement and I think it takes more than that to really understand it. So let's let that one slide and just take the discussion up to this point condensed into this statement, like dissolves like. Okay. So what are some of the effects? The, what are some of the uh, possible influences, right? Environmental influences that can favor or disfavor uh, solution. Uh, we've talked about one already, polarity. Uh, and that's in, in the context of uh, liquid, liquid for the last one and solid liquid for the first one. Uh, now, when we get to pressure effects, we find that the external pressure on a forming solution is ineffective has little or no influence on solutions that are formed from liquids and solids. Pressure only has an effect on solution when there's a gas involved, right? So what we get is Henry's law. Henry's law expresses the solubility of a gas in a liquid under various conditions of pressure. As the pressure changes, what happens to the solubility? All right, so we would look at and remember a law just says what happens doesn't say why doesn't try to explain why it just says this is what happens so if we have a container with our liquid and we have a gas up here okay and then we have piston right here and we can apply force or we can release force then what happens to that gas as we apply pressure well first of all if you've got a gas up here uh, and when you first introduce it it's going to be a one-way street gas is going to go into the liquid and nothing's coming out right 
until you start getting some gas in the liquid and eventually you establish an equilibrium, right? Misdirection, dissolution, balances, uh, evaporation of the gas. So once you form equilibrium, then we can, we can call on Le Chatelier to help us. So what happens when you press on that gas? Well, you can find the gas into a smaller region. You increase, according to the kinetic molecular theory, you increase the number of impacts of the gas on the surface. That's a disturbance in Le Chatelier's terms. And now you have more impacts on the surface than coming out. So you need a readjustment. So what happens? Well, you need to balance the two directions again. So a little more of the gas goes into solution until you reach that balance again. And as you increase the pressure, you do increase the solubility or the uh, increased amount of gas in the liquid. And Henry expressed that as the uh, concentration of the gas in the liquid is equal to the uh, pressure times some proportionality constant. Okay. So let's see if I got that right. Okay. So that just says that uh, concentration and pressure are proportional. Okay? If we solve it for the constant, then it's a quotient is equal to a constant and all quotients equal to constant are direct proportions. So as car, as if it's going to be constant, then as pressure goes up, concentration has to go up too. Otherwise the quotient won't be constant. Okay. So what does that mean in practical terms? Well, if you need to do a calculation, then you got to know what K is with this formula. But remember with our gas laws, they had constants in them too. Uh, and you could calculate the constant if you run the experiment and then do the experiment over again and use that constant. But what if you only know before and after a, a, a single system and two sets of conditions? Then what you get is Right. As long as we don't change anything, we use the same gas and the same liquid and we hold the temperature constant. We can just change the pressure. Then um, this expression is still constant under these conditions and under those conditions. Oops. Sorry. So there's before and after. So that means this is equal to that. We don't need the constant now. So if you set up an experiment where you know these two conditions before and you know one of these after, then you can solve for the other one. That's Henry's law. And I think that was, Henry was his last name. In fact, if it was Henri, then he was French. <laughs> I can't remember which. I think he was French. So here you go. This is a pictorial description of what I was describing earlier. Shows the rate of the uh, the two processes. Right? We put pressure on it. We increase one, and it has to be counterbalanced by the other. So we want to decrease the number of molecules in the headspace. They go into solution to to balance and satisfy Le Chatelier. Okay, that was pressure effects. Um, oh, I skipped over this slide, sorry. Um, common terminology that's used for nonpolar substances is hydrophobic, water fearing, that's afraid of water, doesn't like water. So hydrophobics um, are usually, are nonpolar, and because water is polar, uh, they don't mix well with water. Hydrophilic, on the other hand, they do like water because they are polar molecules. 
and water is polar. So that's just terminology. Hydrophobic versus hydrophilic. Uh, phobic is Greek for afraid of, and philic is, is one of their words for love or like. Okay, temperature effects. Now we're going to confine our discussion to aqueous solutions. And it depends on whether you're dissolving uh, a solid slash liquid in water or you're trying to dissolve a gas in water. For most solids, the solubility of a solid increases with the temperature of the solvent. So you heat the water up and the solvent, you can put more solute into the solvent. Under most cases, there are a few exceptions. And there's really no, at this stage in our study, there's no good explanation for why that happens. It's operationally defined, in other words. <clears throat> um, but in general, increasing temperature increases solubility for solids and liquids for that matter. Uh, for gases, it's just the opposite. The solubility of gas tends to decrease with increasing temperature. So let's see, we've got these examples of solids. Right? So as the temperature goes up here on the x-axis, what's the solubility? How many grams of solute will be dissolved in 100 grams of water? Now that looks like mass mass percent, but it doesn't fit our definition. Why? Well, first of all, it is parts per hundred, yes, that's percent. Parts per hundred parts. But instead of being um, mass of the solute per mass of the solution, it's mass of the solute per mass of the solvent. Okay, there's a difference. It's, it's important to recognize that difference. Now, the information is still useful, but it depends on what you're using it for. And if you try to use one interchangeable with the other, you get different results. So this just means if you have 100 grams of water, this is how many grams will go into that solution at that temperature. So sugar is extremely soluble. 180 grams of sugar in 100 grams of water at zero degrees Right. Um, that's a lot. And it only goes up with temperature. Uh, another example, potassium nitrate. Very steep curve. When the temperature increases, much, much more potassium nitrate goes into solution. Shallower curves like for sodium nitrate, sodium bromide, potassium bromide. Those increase, but they're shallower increases. The slope is shallower. Potassium chloride will also. But these red ones, these two sulfates, their solubility actually decreases as temperature goes up. I mean, it doesn't decre decrease much. Eh, maybe cesium sulfate does. It goes from 20 down to almost zero. Uh, sodium sulfate goes from maybe 61 or two. Actually, it's more than that. Uh, let's see, 40, about 65 grams at uh, 30 degrees centigrade. And it drops to probably 50 at 100 degrees. How about gases? Notice the solubility of all these gases decreases with temperature. Uh, even helium, but helium is the lowest solubility of all, the least soluble. <clears throat> and in fact, the solubility is in terms of thousandth of a mole per liter. So that's, that's a very small amount. If you but 
think of what happens when uh, a gas is under pressure. Say you're a diver and you're breathing 80% nitrogen, 79% uh, nitrogen, 20% oxygen in your tank and you're going down to depth. So as you go down deeper and deeper, more and more of those gases dissolve in your tissues, in the water, in your tissues, based on Henry's law. So what happens if you go from, say, um, 100 feet, which should be about uh, 30, about three atmospheres, and you come up to one atmosphere, just like that. Well, if you've been down at depth for 30 minutes to an hour and you come back up quickly, then that the pressure is released from those gases and they come out of solution. And, and they accumulate in various places in your tissue and you get um, what they call the bends or decompression sickness. So if you don't get into a, a, a pressurized tank, uh, vessel in a hurry and drive those gases back into solution, you could die. You have to come up slowly, let the gases come out and you breathe them back out in your exhales. Well, um, notice that the solubility of nitrogen is much higher than helium. Right? So one of the solutions to that is oxygen in a helium atmosphere. So if you're going to go really deep, instead of nitrogen as the uh, solvent, make helium the solvent. Because helium is less soluble in your tissues and you're less likely to experience decompression sickness when you come up. There's also uh, another process called nitrogen narcosis. When you go to deep, very deep, then the, uh, the effects of more nitrogen dissolved in your tissues affect the way that your synapses operate, the nerves function, and you can go wacko. You've seen, uh, let's see, what was the name of that movie? Um, shoot, it escapes me. <clears throat> But the, uh, the aliens that visited the Earth were actually under the sea. And uh, I can remember the actors. Uh, Michael Bean was a Marine who, was, who went down to this uh, undersea drilling rig. And uh, it was fairly deep in the ocean. And he started experiencing these uh, nitrogen narcosis. And the story developed from there. I'll think of it in a minute. <clears throat> anyway. Um, so, the solubility of gases tends to decrease with temperature. So if you increase the temperature of your solution, the gases will come out. And that's what you see on the stove when you boil water. Right? You put water on the stove, heat it up. First thing you see is little tiny bubbles forming uh, along the surface of the pan. That's not water. Those are dissolved gases. Not water boiling. Dissolved gases come out of solution first before you get to a temperature that's sufficient to vaporize the water. So why does that happen? Well, if you look at, let's use the kinetic molecular theory again. If you've got gases dissolved in your liquid, here, 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 and you've got some up here, Right. So they're exchanging. Right. If you increase the temperature of the solution, what are you doing to these gas molecules? Well, their average kinetic energy is increasing also. Right. They're moving faster. So they tend to escape more from the surface. And they don't come back into the solution as fast. So you need to reduce the number of gas molecules in the solution until you get reestablished that equilibrium. And if this is open to the atmosphere, you won't have equilibrium. You'll get rid of all the gas. 
so that the kinetic energy of the molecules in the gas increased to a point where uh, all of them are gone. Okay, so that's the short version of, of why solubility of gases decreases with the increase in temperature. This is a neat little experiment. <clears throat> if you have a bell jar and you put a concentrated solution here on one side in a beaker and you put the pure solvent over here on the other side, eventually you'll notice that the solvent disappears and the solute increases in volume. Right? So why does that happen? Well, we didn't put anything else in there. So the only explanation and for simplicity's sake, the solute in here is non-volatile, right? It won't, it doesn't volatilize. Say it's uh, sodium chloride. So the only thing that's volatile is water. So the only explanation is that water vapor has, uh, in trying to establish equilibrium, it's continuously vaporizing and not much is coming back. So it goes over here and it, dissolves, it sets up its own equilibrium with this solution and tends to drive more water into solution. Now, with a sodium chloride solution, this is gonna take a long time to happen. But there are some solutes that are especially hydrophilic. And sulfuric acid is one of them. If you mix up a concentrated solution of sulfuric acid over here and water over here, within a couple of days, all that water is transferred over. All right. So now that leads us to a discussion of vapor pressure. So uh, with this bell jar sealed, as the water evaporates, it establishes a pressure in the headspace above. And if it was just water and not the solution, right, just have the water, then you would reach a point where water was vaporizing at the same rate that it was condensing. And you would establish equilibrium. And at a given temperature, that equilibrium would have a, a certain pressure in the headspace. I think for water, it's in the neighborhood of 23 or 24 millimeters of mercury at room temperature, standard temperature, I should say. But all uh, pure materials, uh, liquids, will establish a vapor pressure. And it depends on the liquid. For water, where the, the forces, intermolecular forces holding the water molecules together are very strong, the vapor pressure will be low by comparison to one in which the um, intermolecular forces are very weak, then more of the liquid can evaporate. And equilibrium is established at a higher vapor pressure. Um, diethyl ether is a perfect example of that. So how do we express the vapor pressure in terms of the effect that a solution has on the vapor pressure? The experimental evidence tells us that um, you have a vapor pressure for the pure solvent, but if you put a non-volatile solute in there, the vapor pressure goes down. So why is that? Well, think about it. At the surface of this liquid, you've got solute molecules in here and the solvent is trying to evaporate, but these guys are in the way. There are not as many solvent molecules at the surface as there were before. So you don't get as many vaporizing and equilibrium is established at a lower pressure. And we can quantify that, right? The actual measured pressure of a solution is equal to the 
pure solvent vapor pressure times the mole fraction of the solvent. Right? So let's say we calculate the mole fraction of this sodium chloride solution, where the mole fraction of sodium chloride is equal to 0 0.2. What's the mole fraction of the solvent that we need right here? The total has to be 1. So subtract 0.2 from 1, and the mole fraction of water equals 0 0.8. Okay, then you just take the pure solvent vapor pressure times 0.8 and you get the solution vapor pressure. Everything else being equal, don't change the temperature. Definitely not the temperature because the vapor pressure will go up with temperature. Okay, so that's when you have a non volatile solute. But so many solutions are. Uh, two volatile components, right? Suppose we've got um, drinking alcohol here, right? 70% um, ethanol, right? Whiskey. What's going to be the vapor pressure of the ethanol and the vapor pressure of the water? <sighs> well, we have to modify the equation, right? Oh, Excuse me. This has a name. Um, this is called Rayle's Law. And Rayle's Law just says that as the mole fraction of the solvent increases, the vapor pressure of the solvent increases. And it's proportional to the mole fraction. If we have two liquids together, and they're both volatile, then the total pressure is equal to the partial pressure of each one. Now, where did I get that? Anybody remember John Dalton? Law of partial pressures. So the partial pressure of this volatile is equal to the partial, is summed with the partial pressure of the other one, which equals the total. Okay? So if we measure the total pressure and we know the mole fraction of one, plus we know the pure par partial pressure that would be for each one, that's, you can take that out of a chart, a table. Then we can solve for the unknown mole fraction of the other one, right? Just like any equation, if we know everything but one unknown, it's solvable. Now, um, there's a difference between ideal solutions and non-ideal solutions. So let's take a look at those. Remember when we had uh, partial pressure of our A component, right? If there's zero mole fraction or one mole fraction, if there's zero mole fraction, partial pressure is zero, right? <laughs> that only makes sense. There's nothing there. But if it's pure, then it will have a certain and this is P zero. If it's pure, that's the pure partial pressure. And it has various, as the mole fractions change, that's for that one. But if we have another liquid in there, uh, if, if this one is one, then the other one has to be zero, right? So let's say this one is the first component, but this one is the second component. It goes from zero to one, right? The other direction. While this one's going up, this one has to go down, right? Because they have to add to one. So what happens to the curve for the B? This is A. Well, B might be a different partial pressure here. 
This is A. This is B. Maybe it's lower, right? It has a stronger intermolecular force for the for the B than the A does. So it might have a lower partial pressure when it's pure, right here. Well, when it's zero, of course, it's going to be zero. So it would be like this. Okay? That's if they're separate from one another. Now, if you put them together and they're ideal, and ideal means no interaction whatsoever. A and B do not interact. They act independently, and their partial pressures can be determined independent of one another. Then what you get for the total is just for any position on here, that one plus that one, which would be in this neighborhood. Okay, so this is the total at any given mole fraction of each. That's ideal. Now, what if they tend to interact with one another? The, the place in this graph where they interact the most is where they're relatively equal in concentration. So in the middle of each curve, you would get an interaction. So what if they interacted with one another strongly, right? So as they interact and the concentrations approach one another, there's more chance for interaction. They depress the total or actually the individual partial pressures. They, they depress that because they bond with one another. So in that case, each one would be like this, right? The curve would be concave, concave. Then when you add them together, you get a concave. That's when they interact with one another. What if they repel one another, right? They don't like each other at all. Then the opposite happens. You get something that goes like that, like that. So the total would be like that. Okay. Those are non-ideal situations. And that's what they look like. So here's the ideal, right? And here's the the case where you get, um, they say weak sol solvent interactions. I think that's a misnomer. Um, I think in this case, you would have uh, repulsive interactions. If they're very weak solvent solute interactions where they just ignore one another, then they would behave independently and you'd have ideal situation. But if there was strong attractive forces, then you get the concave bow, and that's what the total looks like. All right. So let's look at examples. Maybe that'll help. All right. So here's the ideal situation where the interaction between A and B and B and B is roughly the same as A with B, right? There's no, you can't tell any difference between the two. The heat of solution is virtually zero and the solution is ideal. There's no deviation from Reynolds law. An example of that is benzene and toluene. All right, benzene is a, uh, cyclical ring compound like that. That's pure benzene. And toluene is similar. It just has a methyl group on it. Um, so this one interacts with benzene a certain way and this one interacts with toluene a certain way and they interact equally the same way with each other as they do with their own kin. That's an ideal solution. 
what if the um, interaction is gives you an exothermic reaction, negative, where the interaction of, of A and B is very strong, then the deviation is negative. You get that dip, right? They're suppressing each other's volatility. An example of that is acetone in water. So acetone attracts acetone, water attracts water, but when you put them together, acetone and water attract each other very strongly as compared to the pure substances. In that case, you get the negative deviation, right? Water is like this, and acetone is like this. Um, like that. Of course, it's probably trigonal. It's probably a trigonal planar, I think. Uh, so they have a very strong interaction with one another. Um, this one, ethanol and hexane. Ethanol has the potential for hydrogen bonding. Oops, sorry. There you go. So you get hydrogen bonding here, but you try to mix it with hexane, and hexane is just hydrogens all around it, right? They do not mix ethanol and hexane. They, if they do anything, they repel. Well, the interaction is extremely weak. So that's why this is, is very small compared to these two interactions. And in that case, you get a positive. So they don't like each other. And the vapor pressure of each goes up. Okay. So how about, um, let's say, which one would be ideal? Well, let's see, there's hexane and chloroform. Mm. Ah, this one looks like it would be ideal. Hexane and octane, they're both hydrocarbons. So they would probably be ideal. Ethanol and water are strongly attracted. They would be a negative deviation, whereas uh, hexane and chloroform um, don't particularly care for one another. They would be a positive deviation. Oops, doesn't say. Okay, so this would be positive, this would be negative, and this would be ideal. I need to modify that slide so it'll put the answers in there. Okay, let me see. Uh, we're good. We're good on time. All right, now let's take some of these properties and use them to actually gain information in a laboratory setting. And your first lab exercise does exactly that. It uses what we call a colligative property. So what does colligative mean? Think of colligative as collective. In other words, um, the expression that relates any of these to concentration does so independently of the solute. Now the solvent will behave differently, but when you have the solute and identified its relationship with the solvent, it doesn't matter what the solute is, right? As long as it goes into solution, it will have the same effect no matter what it is. And this is a good thing, actually. Remember when we were, when we were determining uh, molecular formulas using percent composition data to get the empirical formula, and then we needed another piece of information, the molar mass. 
to finish the puzzle and determine the molecular formula. Where did that molar mass come from? If you don't know the molecule, you can't calculate. But if you use a colligative property, then you don't need to know the structure. You don't need to know the molecular formula to determine its molar mass. And we're going to use that in the second lab, molar mass by freezing point depression, to determine the molar mass of, let's see, which one is it? Uh, benzoic acid, I think it is. Okay, so how do we express these uh, colligative properties? Well, boiling point elevation, it's a very simple formula. And when we say boiling point elevation, we're saying boiling point plus some change in temperature. Right? And this is the part that we use in the formula. Uh, like that. And this is of the solute. Right. So this is the boiling point constant, boiling point elevation constant for the solvent. So it'll be one value for water, it'll be a different value for lauric acid in our lab two method. You need to know that value. Then, uh, if you're determining the molality of the solution, you measure a temperature difference. And the temperature difference is what's the normal boiling point for the solvent compared to the boiling point after you add the solute. And that difference is this, not the total, just the difference. So what is molality? Molality is moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. Okay. So if you have an unknown solvent, uh, solute, you can measure the temperature change as you add the when you add the solute, you've got this constant value. Then you can solve for the molality. What was the concentration? Well, how do you tease out the moles? Well, you need to know how much did the solvent weigh, right? And you can get that in your experiment. So you can solve for the moles of the solute by doing that experiment. Then what do you need? If you're gonna get molecular weight, or molar mass, you need to know mass per mole. Right. So before you do the experiment, before you add the solute, you, you, you weigh it. You find out what's the mass of the solute. So now you have that from this experiment, plus you have the mass that you already weighed. You can determine the molecular weight or the molar mass of the solute using this colligative property, and it doesn't matter what it is. Right? It's independent, right? There's nothing in here that says uh, it's, a, it's moles of benzoic acid and nothing else. It could be moles of anything, as long as it goes into solution. Okay, so that's the expression for boiling point elevation. In the experiment we're gonna do, we use freezing point depression. So think of it as if you add a solute, it makes the boiling point go up. But if you add a solute, it also makes freezing point go down. So it spreads them apart. Actually, there's, there's more temperature between them. But the difference here is that we change this and this value the difference is how much does it decrease the freezing point? That's the one we're using for benzoic acid dissolved in lauric acid in, in lab experiment two.
Okay, and notice we have to use molality, right? Because we're, we're looking at a temperature change. So we have to use molality, we can't use molarity. But, oh, excuse me, no buts yet. I gotta show you what it looks like in a phase diagram, right? So here's the pressure and here's the temperature. And um, this red line is for pure water, right? So here's the triple point and here's the dividing line between liquid uh, solid, excuse me, uh, no, liquid and gas, excuse me, liquids in here, and solids over here, so this line is between solid and liquid, right, and this line is between solid and gas. So what happens to your phase diagram when, uh, for the solution versus the pure solvent? The pure solvent is the red line, the solution is the blue line. So we bring the temperature down for this phase between uh, solid and liquid. And we also bring this one down, you just take that whole thing and slide it between liquid and gas. So the difference between boiling point here and here because that's one atmosphere, right? That's where a boiling point occurs, typically. Then for water, it's here, but as we slide it down, we actually expand this curve out and gives us an increase in boiling point. Whereas over here, this one is the freezing point. So we actually decrease the freezing point. That's just what it looks like in a phase diagram. Okay. Let me see, how many more slides do I have? Uh, well, as always, if I run out of time, I shouldn't, but if I do, I'll just keep talking until I'm done. Let's say we prepare a solution with 25 grams of glucose and 200 grams of water. We know the molar mass of glucose. What's the boiling point of the resulting solution? Right, so the question is, what's the boiling point of the solution? So how do we get that? Well, we get the boiling point of the pure solvent plus The boiling point elevation. So we know the boiling point of water, it's 100 degrees centigrade Celsius. So this is the part that we need to find. Okay, so boiling point elevation means we're going to be using There we go. So in order to calculate that, we need this. We also need this, which I don't have on this slide, do I? I have to look it up, All right? So I'll go on my other computer. So I need uh, boiling point elevation. constant. For water. And let's see. Where did it go? That's not there. Let's back up. Ah, here it is. 
For water, it's uh, 0 0.512. Yep, 0 0.512. Now, what are the units of measure on that? Well, we need to have degrees Celsius equal on both sides. So that one has to be in the numerator, right? And we need to cancel molality. So molality needs to be in the denominator. Okay, so what's the molality of our solution? Well, let's see, we've got 25 grams of glucose. So how many moles is that? hundred and eighty point one six so we'll find out how many moles of glucose we have point one three eight eight moles of glucose but that's not the concentration so how many kilograms of solvent do we have? 200 grams of water. So that's 0 0.2 kilograms. So we divide by 0 0.2 kilograms, and that gives us molality. Uh, 0 0.69, 6938. Wait a minute. Yeah, four significant figures. Okay. So what's the change in temperature? If I did that right. Yeah. Divided by point two. You know, that's not right. Hold on a second. 0.1388.2 divide. Yeah, that's what it says. Ah, ah, okay, I'm good. Now we multiply 0.6938 times 0.512, and we get 0.35. Three five five two. So we add that to 100. Which is equal to 100.3, well, keep them all. 100.3552, let's see, I think they rounded it off. 0.35, okay. So if we round ours off, it's 0.36. That's because I kept all of my significant figures that I was allowed. And they probably rounded somewhere in between. Okay. So there's a, a calculation. Um, sometimes, let's go back just for a second and look at the constant. So if we actually have a molal value over here, then that will cancel. But if we have, um, instead of the molal calculation, we have, um, let's see, moles of solute per 0 0.200 kilograms. Isn't that it? Yeah. then they won't cancel. 
So we need to know what is molal. So let's substitute in here. Um, degree C, and then what is molal? Moles per kilogram. So if we put down here, moles per kilogram, that's a fraction within a fraction. And remember, anytime you have a fraction in the denominator, if you bring it into the numerator, it inverts. So kilograms now is on top and moles is still in the denominator. There we go. Now that expression will cancel kilograms and leave us with um, moles degree centigrade. If we have moles degree centigrade, then the degree centigrade on this side will cancel that centigrade and leave us with moles. So that's the one that you're going to be using in the experiment two, only this value will be different. That, that's just for water. Okay. It doesn't matter what the concentration is, but it does matter what the solvent is. All right. Okay. board is there. A board's walking. Now, suppose, suppose your solute uh, is sucrose. When it goes into water, it's still sucrose. It's a whole molecule, right? So, before and after is a single molecule. But if we use sodium chloride, sodium chloride is one molecule solid, but two molecules in solution, or two ions in solution, excuse me. That changes the molal concentration of sodium chloride. It's no longer, uh, say, one mole of sodium chloride in a kilogram. It's now two moles of ions and the total number of moles of the particles matters. So we have to introduce a correction factor. It's called the Van Hoff factor, represented by that small i. Ideally, it's just the ratio of how many moles of particle in solution versus the solute before it's dissolved. So if that happens, like sodium chloride, I would be two because you get two ions for every one um, formula unit of sodium chloride. Potassium nitrate would be two. Why? Well, because nitrate is a polyatomic ion. It doesn't dissociate. So you only get two ions there, potassium and nitrate. But sodium phosphate breaks into four ions. So I would be four for this one. Now that's the ideal situation and will closely approximate reality, particularly if the solution is dilute. But as the concentration increases, then you have the probability of ions pairing off temporarily. So you get sodium chloride still in solution, but it's paired, sodium and chloride ion, and it behaves as a single unit for a split second. And then some other pairing takes its place. This only happens with high concentrations, the ion pairing. So where sodium chloride would be two theoretically, it may be only 1.8 if the concentration is at a high enough level. And that has to be determined, be determined experimentally. Okay, uh, this is the modified equation for, for either one. Doesn't matter what the K is. 
or whether it's boiling point elevation or freezing point depression, I is still the same. Um, let's see, do I work? I think I worked this one out. So we're given 20 grams of sucrose and uh, oh, no, uh, this is tricky. You're given 20 grams of sucrose and sodium chloride mixture. So you don't know how much of each one there is. The freezing, freezing point of this solution is found to be minus 0.426. So what's the freezing point depression? 0 0.426 degrees centigrade. Okay. So we would say the delta T or uh, freezing point is 0 0.426 degrees C. And the uh, mass of the solvent would be what? One liter of water weighs how much? It's a thousand milliliters. And if there's one gram per milliliter, it's a thousand grams. One liter weighs one kilogram. So the mass of the solvent is one kilogram. Okay. Uh, the mass of the mixture, the mass of the solutes is 20 grams. And it's composed of sodium chloride and sucrose. Okay. I'm putting all this information up here, extracted from the word problem, because that hasn't changed. All word problems are designed to confuse. So let's assume ideal behavior. Right? So when the sodium chloride goes in the solution, it makes two for every one. And when the sucrose gets in the solution, it's one to one. Calculate the mass percent composition and the mole fraction in the original mixture. Okay. Sounds like a lot. It has to be broken down methodically. So there's the information we need. What's our approach? Okay, here's the information. Okay, I kept the sign here because of the freezing point depression. Maybe that's needed, maybe it's not, let's see. So, what do we know about the solution, uh, about the mixture? Well, the mixture is composed of two components. So if we know the mass of one, we know the mass of the other. So if we let one of them be X, then the mass of the other one would be 20 minus X. Okay. So we let sucrose in this case be X and the mass of sodium chloride then will be 20 minus X. All right. The molar mass of sucrose is 342.34 grams per mole. So if we want to know the number of moles of sucrose, we have to use that conversion factor with the X to give us the moles of sucrose. And if we look at the, uh, uh, if X is in what? X is in grams, X grams and 342.34 is grams per mole, right? So grams cancel and moles goes into the numerator. So I'm just checking our math. This quotient is valid as an expression of moles for sucrose. So we can use that expression also for sodium chloride. Moles of sodium chloride would be 20 minus X divided by its molar mass. Okay, so we've established those two. <clears throat> So what's the molality of the solution? Well, <clears throat> the molality of the solution is moles of, <clears throat> excuse me, 
is moles of sodium chloride plus the moles of sucrose divided by a kilogram. I've got a question rattling around in the back of my head. If we're going to use this molality in our calculation, then, okay, good. I've made this, I've shown you the assumption that the Van Hoff correction factor is actually two for sodium chloride. So the molality of the solution is not the same as the molality we just expressed on the previous slide. So there you have uh, delta T is this one. The freezing point depression constant is 1.86 for water. Okay, let's keep going. So we have this freezing point depression and there's our correction factor times the molality, all right? So these two expressions are in terms of this one for sucrose and this one for sodium chloride. And the I has to be, you actually have two moles there. And that this molality in the expression is equal to this value Let's back up. Uh, where did I get the point two? Hold on a second. I times M. Oh, oh. I skipped a step. If we solve for I M, what is this? This is that divided into this. 0.426 divided by 1.86 is 0 0.2290. Okay? And I threw myself for a second. I said, where did I get that number? I just solved the equation for these two unknowns together. Now, these two unknowns, th these together, are actually a sum of these two. So this expression is the contribution from sucrose, and this is the contribution from uh, sodium chloride. Because this molality is the expression of that one, and this molality is the expression of that one. So now we just solve it for x, right? And eventually we get down to this point where, and we go to the next slide, so once we follow all the calculations through to the end, X ends up to be 14.55 grams of sucrose. Then sodium chloride is the other. And we calculate the mass percent right, for each one. So those are the mass percents for each of the, the sucrose and the sodium chloride. And it also asks us for mole fraction, did it not? So we just take the, the mass this is for sucrose, divided by the number of moles total. So we have to do individual calculations for each of the components. And that's the uh, mole fraction of sucrose. So if that's the mole fraction of sucrose, wait a minute, did it ask us for the mole fraction of uh, sodium chloride? Let's go back at the problem. No, it just asked for sucrose. So that's why we stopped at sucrose, because it only asked for that one. What we would do for sodium chloride was we would just take this one out and duplicate this one up here and do a similar calculation for sodium chloride. OK. Uh, OK, we got time. So if you're, oh, did I get somebody else showing up? Uh, oh, Cody. Cody's here. How about uh, Christopher Windsor? I don't see Chris. Okay, 
<clears throat> back to the problem. This problem, actually, this problem can only be solved if we use a colligative property that we haven't discussed yet. <clears throat> so the problem is we have a plant cell that has a concentration of 0 0.25 molal. And you put it in an aqueous solution with a freezing point of 0.246. Okay, we can solve this one. Yeah, 0.246 freezing point depression. Will the cell shrivel up, explode, or do nothing? Which means what we need to do is say, what's the concentration of the solution surrounding the cell? If it's equal to 0.25 molal, then it'll do nothing, right? Based on uh, semi-permeable membrane behavior. Water will move through a semi-permeable membrane, which is the cell wall the cell membrane, uh, and if we find out that the concentration outside the cell is greater than 0.25, then the, shell, the cell will shrivel. And if the concentration of uh, solute outside the cell is less, then water will move into the cell and the cell will explode. So really all we need to do is find out what is the molality of the solution and compare it to the molality inside the cell. Okay. So these are the calculations, uh, the same freezing point depression constant for water. And we do the calculation and find out that the molality uh, outside the cell is 0 0.132, which is less than inside the cell, which means the cell will absorb water through its membrane and explode. Okay. Now we can quantify the pressure that's being developed in that cell. What is, it's called osmotic pressure. What is the pressure inside the cell uh, as it experiences and is exposed to this um, concentration of solution outside. Well, actually it's the other way around. What's the osmotic pressure of the cell contents? That's what the calculation is really about. And the osmotic pressure would be, actually the difference in pressure would be what's the osmotic pressure of this one? What's the osmotic pressure of that one? Then the difference is the osmotic pressure experienced in the cell. So for this osmotic pressure calculation, we're really only interested in the pressure that's developed by a solution exposed to the pure solvent, okay? And then we can go from there. So that expression is this pressure is equal to the molarity right? It's temperature independent, so we can use molarity. This R value, which is the universal gas constant, and temperature, All right? So let's check out our units first. This is pi, All right? And that doesn't mean 3.1417 blah, blah, blah. That's not it's not the pi of a circle thing. This is osmotic pressure. Molarity, gas constant, and uh, what's the temperature? Wait a minute. It's not temperature independent. So why are we using... Oh, I got it. I got your answer right here. What are the units of measure for R? If this is atmospheres, R has to be liter atmospheres. 
per mole K. Okay, if temperature is in K, temperature is canceled before it gets to molarity. So we've already taken temperature into account on this side of the equation, so we can use molarity. Okay? And then this is like uh, moles per liter. So now liters cancel and moles cancel. And all we got left is atmospheres. So that's the osmotic pressure of the solution when it's in contact with the pure solvent through a semi-permeable membrane. What does that look like? Here's an example. So here's the membrane. Remember, semi-permeable means the only thing that can pass through the membrane is water in this solution. In reality, gases will pass also. But we've designed the membrane in such a way that only water will pass. So anything that's dissolved in the solution can't get back through the membrane. It's just water uh, that will pass. So why does water want to go into the solution? Well, let me draw the membrane this way. There's our membrane. And it's semi-permeable. Okay? Which means that only water can pass. So if we have pure solvent over here, and we have water plus solutes over here, <clears throat> the kinetic molecular theory says that the impacts on that membrane from everything are the same on both sides if they're at the same temperature, but it'll only pass water. So the only time that an impact will cause water to go through them will is there are fewer impacts on this side and more impacts on that side because we've got a uh, solute in the way. So what's happening? Well, we're trying to establish an equilibrium and this tends to be going that way, this goes that way, and more water is going this way than that way. Okay, so how does that develop a pressure? Well, if we add pressure to this side, we can increase the number of impacts of water over here. We increase the pressure on this side until we get the same flow, water backwards and forwards. That amount of pressure will equilibrate the system. And that pressure is the osmotic pressure. That's one way to do it. Artificially, just add pressure. The other way is in our device. Let's see how they draw, they draw like this. There we go. <clears throat> so we've got a solution in here. And let's say we've got a, got water out here. And we've got our solution in here. And there's our membrane up here. And at this level, that's where we start. Just for convenience. I know the, the diagram shows it, uh, well, no, it does. It shows it starting here, right at the same level. So we've got the same pressure bearing down here as here and here. But as water moves in here, because it can only go one direction, then this level starts to rise. It keeps rising. So what are you developing here? A difference in mass 
above the level of water, which is applies a force, right? It's an unbalanced force because of this mass of the solution. So this solution rises and it continues to add more pressure to that, 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 and it balances this pressure. And as soon as this pressure again balances that pressure, and that actually it feels it across this membrane. Once those two pressures are equal, then it stops moving. And when it stops moving, that difference is the osmotic pressure. Now, if it's a, if it's a dilute solution, aqueous solution, then you can roughly take the density of that solution as one and calculate the height and the size of the cylinder and do some calculations and find out what is the pressure there. Right. Um, but if you have this connected to a manometer and it's measuring pressure in millimeters of mercury, you can measure directly what is the osmotic pressure. Okay. So there are other ways of expressing this. Uh, if you have this U-tube and the membranes down here, these levels are equal to start with. Then when it stops moving, the difference between this level, which the water has moved in through here and come over here, then the difference between those two is the osmotic pressure. So if this were the cell on this side, then we would be shoving more water into it and the pressure inside would be that difference and eventually it would be high enough to rupture the cell. Okay, osmotic pressure is a similar situation to uh, the colligative properties of freezing point depression, boiling point elevation. If the, uh, if the molarity is expressed in terms of the whole molecule, and when it goes into solution, it breaks up into pieces, then you need that Van Hoff factor to correct for that dissociation. Right? Just like we did with the other equations. Now, how would we calculate the molar mass using osmotic pressure? Well, if we put 33.4 milligrams of a compound in 10 milliliters of water at this temperature, the solution has an osmotic pressure of 558 torr, millimeters of mercury, right? How would that be in atmospheres, right? If we're gonna use this formula, and if it needs a correction factor, if we're gonna use that formula, uh, the pressure has to be in atmospheres. So we take 558 divided by what? 760. So uh, this pressure over here is 558 divided by 760. And that gives us atmospheres. So how do we get at moles? Where in that equation is moles? If we're going to calculate the molar mass, we've already got the mass of the compound. There's milligrams. Now we need moles. So where is moles in here? Right there. Moles per liter. So how many liters do we have? We have 0 0.010. Zero. Right here. And then we have R, right there. So we got liters taken care of, atmospheres on both sides, moles, and K. So where's K? Oh, temperature. So what's the temperature? 25. So what's that in K? 25 plus 273. 
298. There, there. Okay. <clears throat> so if we had a value here for moles, that would cancel. But since we don't, then when we solve for this equation for moles, then all the calculation comes over on this side, moles moves into the numerator, and there we have our answer. Right. So uh, let's see. I think I got everything I need to do. Calculation. Just need my calculator. It's hiding. So let's do this one. Five five eight seven six zero. So that's point seven three four. Atmospheres. Then we've got this in the denominator, and all of these are multiplied. Right? Multiply, divide. So we can bring this one over to the other side and 0 0.01 times 0 0.734. Right. Now we can take this one. This one's in the numerator. So over here, it's a divisor. So 0 0.08206 divide gives us a value. This is in the numerator. So it divides over here. So now we have number of moles equals three zero zero two times ten to the minus four moles okay now how about molar mass mass per moles so what's the mass 33.4 milligrams that it needs to be in grams doesn't it we got moles so how would you write that in um Grams. Well, a milligram is a thousandth of a gram. So we could say 33.4 times 10 to the minus 3 grams. Right? There's your milligram right there. 10 to the minus 3 grams. And then the other thing. And this divided by 3.00 times 10 to the minus 4 moles. So now I need to... 33.4, you put that into your calculator. It's exponential notation. It's not scientific, but it's exponential. And that number is going to be divided by the previous one. And I get a 111 grams per mole. Now, let's see if I made any big boo-boos. Well, there's the calculation. Eh, close. They probably rounded a lot. <laughs> and I didn't round so much. But the method is, is uh, the same. Uh, let's see. We got a different number of moles, right? So let's see if I can figure out. Okay, there, there. Uh, 298, that's right. 0 0.01. Okay, so they're saying moles per liter and then we multiply it by liters. So that's liters. Okay. I'll go with that. All right, so one of the, the last discussions we have is um, what's a colloid? Well, I like to think of colloids as imitation solutions. A colloid uh, is characterized by the particle size of the, and I put this in quotes, the particle size of the solute is very small. It's not really a solute because it's not a solution. So the particle sizes are so small that the kinetic energy of the solvent is sufficient to keep them suspended. 
So how do we know that it's a colloid and not a solution? Well, um, a fellow by the name of Tyndall figured that one out. If memory serves, Tyndall was an English scientist. And he noticed that in a pure solution, so there's our solution, and it's in a glass beaker so light can pass through it. If he shines a light, and in England we call them torches. A flashlight is a torch in England. If he shines a light through a solution, then he can see he can see the light beam on the other side, but he doesn't see anything in the solution. He doesn't see the light beam passing through the solution. Okay. Goes through on the other side. It's like it disappears over here and reappears on the other side. If it's a suspension and a colloid qualifies as a suspension, then there are still particles in there that are not in solution. In other words, there were no holes made for them to fit into. They're just suspended. Then with a colloid, which is a class of suspension, you can see the light beam passing through the solution. That's the Tyndall effect. Why? Because these particles are scattering the light beam in all directions. And you can see the light beam now. But in a solution, there's no scattering. Okay, we're gonna use this effect in uh, lab exercise number five, where we form the complex ion with silver and ammonia and we titrate it with chloride. So remember, when silver and chlorine get together, they're insoluble, correct? Well, that is, unless they have some ammonia in there. But you can see the formation of the silver chloride, very, very, very fine particle size. It's a suspension. You can see it in the beaker if you shine a light beam through it. And the appearance of that silver chloride in solution revealed by the Tyndall effect is an indicator of our end point for the titration. Okay, so what are some practical uh, colloids? Anybody here like Jello? Eat Jello. You're eating a colloid. Gelatin is a protein that does not dissolve in water, but it is a, is a suspended in water, primarily because the molecules are too big. I mean, they're really small, but they're too big to be dissolved. There are various types of colloids, and it depends on, um, see, notice here, we're not talking about solvent and solute anymore. We're talking about the dispersing medium, which would be, analogous to the solvent and the dispersed substance, which would be analogous to the solute. If you put a gas uh, in suspended into a liquid, you get an aerosol or a gas in a solid is also an aerosol. A liquid in a gas is a foam. Uh, excuse me. I got that the other way around. Pardon me. Liquid suspended in a gas is an aerosol, solid suspended in a gas is an aerosol. Um, a gas suspended in a liquid is a foam, 
like whipped cream, soap suds. A liquid in a liquid is an emulsion. So when you, I don't know if you've ever made mayonnaise yourself, but um, when you add the egg to uh, vinegar and that's the oil, the egg acts as an emulsifying agent. It helps keep the oil suspended in small particle sizes. Uh, paints, solid and a liquid. It's called a sol. A sol foam, a solid foam is a gas and a solid, like polystyrene or marshmallows. Uh, let's see, there's some others also. Uh, I think the ceramic tiles on the space shuttle were also a solid foam. They had gas suspended in a solid. They're very light and they don't transmit, uh, transfer heat from the outside into the shuttle. So they have very good insulating qualities. Uh, butter and cheese is a liquid in a solid. And ruby glass, believe it or not, is a colloid of a solid in a solid. Okay. So for certain types of colloids, you can cause the dispersed part of the colloid to come out of come out of its suspended state. And what that basically you do is you make the size of the particles bigger. They coagulate, they, they join together, and they're, now they're too big to be suspended, so they drop out. And that can be done by either heating, particularly if it's a protein, or you can add an electrolyte like salt. It's called salting out. Or you can, in, you can add acid or base and change the, um, the interaction of the suspended medium with its uh, suspending medium. Uh, their relationship of their pH. Okay, that's it.